yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and let those bed. We just started a quick shout out to everyone from the channel. Down with us is the beginning. So I got two people in New York City, uh, Easy Evan and then Crooklyn DBA, he's the finest. Jail in Seattle, Ipa the Greek. Again, these are people that have been helping us out uh, and staying true to us since the beginning. And of course, I want to thank Carnegie Mellon for not firing me uh, for another year. That's always important. Um, the course sponsor for this semester is going to be Amazon. Uh, Amazon is the largest database vendor in the world in terms of market cap, how much money they're making. Right? They make all the money on the store, they make a lot of money on AWS, but they make a ton of money on databases. Redshift, uh, Aurora, RDS, DynamoDB, they have a ton of stuff. Um, it used to be Oracle was number one. Uh, actually, maybe Microsoft was number one for a while, too. Amazon is officially number one as of, actually, Microsoft might be number one still, too. Whatever, they're making a ton of money. Um, so anyway, so they're, they're helping us with the course logistics and sponsoring us. Um, so we're really appreciative of that. And then at the end of the semester, uh, somebody will come and give from the Redshift team, come and give a tech talk about the system that they're building. We will discuss Redshift throughout the semester. Um, but a lot of the techniques that we'll describe during the semester, you know, they're actually implementing in, uh, in their system. All right, so I quickly want to go over the course logistics and what, what they're expected for the semester. But I will spend most of the time on the history of databases because I find that part more interesting. And then as I sent the, uh, the email out over the weekend, um, it'll be based on the two readings. Uh, again, it's, it's not meant to be like deep, deep, in, deep into the internals of data systems just to give you perspective of what the landscape looks like and why we're spending all the time talking about relational databases and not other things. So a lot of you guys are here for obvious reasons. You want to take this course. Um, but just as a final pitch, I'll say the things that we talk about uh, this semester for database systems, and particularly for analytical database systems, um, these are hard problems. Not everyone can do it. And uh, companies pay a lot of money for students not coming to this class from, from other places as well that have experience in working in database systems. Uh, so it's, if you're just a random JavaScript programmer, you know, they're not going to have you touch the database internals. Like the same way they're not going to have you touch the kernel uh, in an operating system. Right? They, don't, they don't want to, you know, people off the street. They want people to understand fundamentally how these systems are working. These are the things that, that we're going to cover. Uh, this is not the full list, but these are just some of the former students that have worked with us uh, in taking this class and places that they've gone. Um, <laughs> These are the ones I had photos. There's a lot of, there's, there's way more that I'm missing. Um, but these are the ones I, I, could, I could quickly find. Um, and yes, three of them are with me at my startup at Ottertune. Um, some of the best ones as well. All right, so the, unlike in previous years where we try to cover maybe in memory database systems and spend a little time discussing transactional systems, uh, this semester we're only going to focus on analytical database systems. Um, just because you know, this is sort of what the hot thing is right now, and there's a lot of money sloshing around, a lot of systems being built, um, and to sort of understand, you know, we want to understand what the sort of the state of the art is and how we got to the point where we are, where we are today. So the goal for you guys is that not only will we become aware of what these systems actually are, what are the key features about them, and help you to sort of understand the trade-offs between one system design or implementation versus another, uh, you'll hopefully also become proficient in writing high-quality systems code. Right, and doing documentation and testing and doing code reviews. Right, these are soft skills that are going to be important when you go out in the real world and do systems development that it's not something like there's any class to say, hey, here's how to write documentation, or here's how to write test code. Uh, it's just things you sort of have to pick up as you go along. So the projects will be designed such that you'll get exposure to these sort of best practices on how to do, do these, to work on data systems. And so this course also, too, is only going to cover state-of-the-art topics. So I'm assuming everyone has taken a database class either last semester, 445, 645, or your undergrad, like we're not going to go over sort of basic what a join is, right? We'll talk how, you know, we, we assume you know how to do a hash join. We'll talk about how to do it parallel and do it, do, do, make it run fast. So the topics that we're going to cover, uh, we'll first start off talking about storage models and, and compression and actually how do you represent data in, 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 you know, in files on disk. Then we'll talk about how to do query execution using sort of modern techniques like vectorization and compilation. Then we'll talk about uh, modern join algorithms. Uh, networking protocols for getting things out of the data, in and out of the database. And then we'll spend a little time talking about how to do query optimization, uh, go much deeper than we, we were able to cover in the intro class. And if you looked at the schedule, the last four or five lectures are actually targeting single database systems. Right? There's a whole lecture on Snowflake, a whole lecture on Databricks, a whole lecture on 
uh, uh, BigQuery or Dremel. And the idea is that we want to take all the things that we discussed throughout the semester and, and then you know, understand the basics of them and then look at a real system that implements all these things and try to understand like, why are they doing this a certain way or what are the, tr the, the, the benefits or what are the disadvantages of the approaches that, th that they're taking. Okay? So, um, again, I'm assuming you've taken, um, taken an intro database class, so we're not going to cover uh, sort of the, the basics of SQL and other things. So all the, the website is up to date. I haven't, I haven't updated the homepage because I try to get, uh, I try to use Dolly to have like the, the last supper or the in the middle. Uh, it didn't work out very well. Uh, I gotta work on it. Anyway, so the, the website is up to date. So the, the syllabus and the schedule is all there. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's stable. Um, so if you understand what, what's expected for you in the course, please go look at that. And of course, I'll say this throughout uh, a couple of times in the beginning, right? For academic honesty, again, this is the advanced, advanced level class. I assume everyone here is smart. Therefore, you don't need to cheat. If you do cheat, we, we will take you over to, to Warner Hall and, and deal with that, okay? And again, when in doubt, if you're not sure about doing something like, hey, I have this little snippet of code that somebody wrote in GitHub. Can I use it in my project? If you're not sure, then, then just ask myself at the TA, okay? All right, my office hours would be Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, the hour before class, uh, upstairs on the ninth floor. And then we can talk about anything you want, any of the projects and the papers, how to get a database job. I have a bunch of database shirts in my office that companies send me. Please come and get, you know, get some, because uh, I'm kind of getting like a little hoarder level, because like, they sent a bunch of me during the pandemic. I have a bunch of boxes. I got to start getting rid of them. So come talk to me. All right, we have one TA, Wan. Uh, he's awesome as f uh, So he's my third year PhD student. He, this is true. He is a former paralegal for like this sketchy law firm. He is a certified chicken farmer. Um, and he is the number one ranked PhD student uh, at Carnegie Mellon for, data, for databases, to be very clear here. So again, he'll be helping with the projects. He'll be a part of the conversations as we go along the semester. Uh, and so by all means, leverage him if you have questions. So the, the expectations are three things. There's reading assignments, projects, and the final exam. Every class will have one assigned reading, except for today's class, and they'll be indicated by the, the icon here. Uh, so I'll I'll post on Piazza what's actually expected in these, um, you know, in, in, these, in, these, uh, in these reading reviews. But the main idea is I, I want you to get out of it is like, read the paper, understand what they're doing, uh, understand like all the things that we talked about and how, to put, how would it fit together in the higher system, a higher level system. But then I'm also curious and understand like, what are the workloads that you to evaluate the, 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 the implementation. It's, for analytical databases, it's most likely going to be TPCH and TPCDS over and over again. But it's good just to know what these things are so that when we go up like project one, project two, actually, or, or project three, uh, you'll have an idea of what workloads you can use based on the papers you've read. And there's a Google form here that is live, and then there'll be just be a drop down and you fill that out. Yes? Just like page four readings. It should, be, it should be three. You can skip three readings. Sorry, I'll fix that. Thank you. Again, all these reviews have to be your, your own uh, writing. Uh, again, some of these papers are pretty state of the art. Like they came out last week, and so there's probably not going to be a review on the internet you can use. Uh, you could try chat GPT, see what happens. Um. <laughs> All right, so project one, we'll, we'll post next week, but you'd be basically writing a, a foreign data wrapper for Postgres to process columnar data format, like a parquet file. The idea here is just to sort of expose you to how to do vectorized execution uh, in the context of Postgres, so we don't worry about do SQL parsing, we don't worry about doing query planning, let Postgres handle all that. And the idea here would be that you'd be able to see the trade-offs between like, your sort of custom engine on the columnar data versus Postgres's row-based uh, iterator model. So again, if what I'm saying doesn't make sense, then that's not good because we covered these things in the intro class. Um, but you know, make sure you at least go back and look at them and understand what, what I'm talking about. Again, we'll post this next week. Project two is going to be writing uh, an article for our encyclopedia. Uh, so we have an encyclopedia of databases. It's every single database that I'm aware of. And so the idea would be you go look at the documentation, go read, maybe even run these systems, go talk to the developers, understand how they're implementing the different parts, uh, these different parts of the system that we care about, and you'd be writing some, you know, writing an article for this, okay? And of course, don't plagiarize for this. Uh, avoid marketing language. Sometimes I give the companies access to the website, and they'll say, like, you know, so and so, my database is the fastest one ever, right? And like, we have to remove all that. Like, only say things that you can back up by, by specific claims. Right? We more care about the internals, not like how people feel about the database, if that makes sense. 
All right, project three will be a group project. Uh, and the idea here would be some, you know, some larger topic that you're interested in that's based on the things we're discussing throughout the semester. It doesn't have to be in Postgres, but if you want it to, uh, it can be. Um, and the idea here is that you just want to you know, build something that, that, that sh exhibits some uh, understanding or mastery of the materials we discussed throughout the semester. Okay? And again, I'll post some topics as, as we get closer. You won't have to decide later until March what exactly you want to do. Um, I have some ideas of things that I want to do that could potentially turn into a short paper or like a capstone project. Um, again, we can, we can discuss these as we go along. Again, don't plagiarize. All your code has to be your, I think code you submit to us has to be yours unless, unless you discuss and, and it's attributed. Same thing for the encyclopedia. Please don't just copy from the, from the, um, from random things on the internet. One year somebody copied from Wikipedia and they had like the little, like there's the text and then the square bracket and then the number for the citation. So we had to go deal with that. Um, okay? And again, so, what, so the reason why I keep showing this, because this is on video now, because then if you guys do plagiarize, and then I go up to turn you in, I show them the, 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 the video link on YouTube, or like, hey, okay, here's me discussing this, and you're screwed. <laughs> All right, there'll be a final exam, it'll be take home, long form questions. I did try Jet, Chat GPT, and it was not able to answer them. Um, <laughs> So who knows whether how much how much better that'll get? So it's, it's either that like, it, it's a, I wonder if it's a limitation of ChatGPT or whether my questions are just terrible, uh, and I can't parse them. Yes. ChatGPT is like really bad at like kind of like specialized questions. Like it can answer basic computer science questions really well, but once you delve into specifics, it kind of like drops the ball, but like terribly. But it phrases its answer so you think it's right. Yeah, it's like multi-version concurrency control is important because it does multi-versioning. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Uh, that, that's what it told me. Okay. Uh, all right. Gray breakdown is like this. Again, this is on the syllabus. Um, no big surprises here. And then the Cordis mailing list, everything will be on Piazza. If you have any technical questions as, about Project 1 and potentially Project 3 as we go along, uh, please post on Piazza. Don't email Juan or myself directly. Uh, and if anything else, like, you know, your health issues or whatever you have going on, um, please email directly. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? All right, let's get to good stuff, databases. Um, yeah, one year somebody complained on YouTube, was like, I spent, you spent 25 minutes discussing logistics of the course, get to the good stuff. So here we are. All right, so as I said, the, this is sort of my abridged history of the last 50, 60 years of databases. Um, so we're not gonna go too deep into any one topic, but it's just gonna give you a, uh, gonna, an overview of the lay of the land that like, and I think what's actually really interesting about this is that uh, databases are a hot era, area, you know, area right now in both research and in, in industry, and yet they're, what, 60 years old? The first one's going to be from the 1960s, right? Uh, it just shows you how, much, how important they are and how hard the problem is if, like, it's, it's clearly not a solved problem. And so it's gonna, this, this, this lecture is sort of derived from two papers. The first one was called What Goes Around Comes Around, and it's written by uh, Mike Sternbecker and Joe Hellerstein in 2006. And it's basically Mike's, Mike's uh, assessment of the database, uh, of the database industry and how he, he was right uh, for the last 40 years. Um, Mike won the Turing Award in 2014, so uh, I would agree with him. And then the paper, this other one draft I sent you, this is Mike and I wrote this last year, uh, where we basically looked at where this paper left off and said, what's the next 16, 17 years? And this was actually triggered by me because there was some like, post on Hacker News where somebody's like, I don't know why people keep using relational databases. Graph databases is the way to go. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I said that to Mike and like, let's write the new one. Um, so the, the, major, the major takeaway I want you guys to get from this is that, again, even though databases are really old, the concept is really old, uh, they're highly relevant today because at the end of the day, every application, what are they essentially doing? Right? They're, they're, they're exposing some user interface for, for for either a human or, or another machine or something to interact with the database, right? And so what's gonna be interesting is a lot of the things that we'll cover this semester, these are not new ideas, they're not new concepts. I'm gonna see, I said this in the intro class, I'll keep saying this over and over again in the, throughout the semester, IBM did a lot of this stuff in the 1970s. Just, you know, obviously the hardware was much different and the landscape was much different, but a lot of the things we'll talk about will be just modern incarnations of what IBM invented 50 years ago. We're gonna spend a whole lecture on query compilation, 
right? How to take a SQL query, turn it into a query plan, and then convert that query plan into uh, machine code. IBM did that in the 1970s with System R. Right? They did it in assembly. We'll, and now we use LLVM. Um, but again, the, the techniques are not new. The other big thing that's going to happen, and you'll see this the rest of your life, is that every 10 years, somebody's going to come along and say, hey, SQL is stupid. Or at least a model, that's slow, right? We can do it better. Here's my new, my new, my new, my new database system that doesn't use relational model of SQL, right? And everyone's going to, everyone's going to go all excited, like, oh, this is the future, yada yada yada. SQL's old, SQL's busted. We don't want to use that. And then, lo and behold, people realize, oh, yeah, the relational model was a good idea, or SQL is a good idea. And either that thing that the new invention that comes along, either that fails, or the the whatever ideas that the, the this new idea, or this new concept, or new database system has. That'll just get adopted by the SQL, by the SQL standard and by the relational model. Then that thing goes away. All right? So I think, you know, I've seen this in my own life. Like, no SQL is a hot thing. People said, oh, SQL's slow, SQL's stupid, relational model's stupid. You want to do documents, you want to do JSON. And everybody built all these JSON databases, right? And then now we're at the point where, okay, maybe that's a bad idea for, for everything. JSON's good for some things, so the relational model now supports JSON. And then all the NoSQL systems that d said SQL is a bad idea, every one of them except for Redis supports SQL, right? Mongo supported SQL last, last year, right? So you're going to see this throughout the, the theme as we go along is that at least once we get past, once the relational model gets invented, people will say every 10 years it's stupid, and then it turns out it wasn't. And mark my word, you'll see this the rest of your life. I guarantee it. All right, so let's start at the very, 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 very beginning. 1960s. So to the best of my knowledge, uh, at least what is considered conventional wisdom, the very first database system, our sort of general purpose database system, was this thing called uh, Integrated Data Store, or I IDS. Um, and when I say general purpose, what I mean is that it was a database system that was designed to support arbitrary data sets or databases. Right? You obviously, you can write a little Python application yourself and read and write files that's just for exactly the, the, you know, that one database. That's not what I mean by this. Like, those things sort of existed, but this was one that built specifically to say, okay, we can then reuse the system for another application domain or an another, another customer. So GE built this for, um, it was like some timber company out of Seattle that had a you know, huge, huge uh, uh, inventory tr uh, tracking problem that they needed to deal with. And so they built this thing called IDS to handle that. Um, and then they ended up spinning it out of that, that custom solution that for the, the timber company and try to sell it as a, as a standalone product. Right? Like GE was trying to be a software vendor. Is G, GE the hot thing in computers right now? No, right? So what they, <laughs> the huge mistake they did is that they had this company policy at the time where GE said, if we're not number one in some industry, we don't want to be in it at all. So they were like the number three computer seller. That wasn't good enough for them. And then they, so they sold off their computing division to Honeywell, right? So then Honeywell owned, uh, owned, owned IDS, and then they were, they were sort of selling it for a while. So there could be two key things about IDS uh, that are going to be bad ideas that are going to then get uh, fixed in the relational model. The first is going to be this, this network data model, and I'll explain what that is in a second. And then the other one's going to be this notion of a tuple at a time query, meaning like I'm going to write basically four loops in my program to iterate over one tuple at a time and do something. Right? As we know in SQL, though, we're going to operate over bags, over sets, right? so we can declare what the thing we actually want to do that then could apply to multiple tuples. And that's going to be way more efficient. So, IDS didn't really take off, as far as I know. Um, but what actually came out of the project was this thing called Codasil. I, always should, I should do a survey before the class starts. Who's ever heard of Codasil? Well, who, who, not from the previous class. One, a few. OK, yeah. Um, so Codasil was to be the hot thing in databases. This, is, this was the thing that everyone's going to build for their database. And obviously, we don't. So there was this guy, Charles Bachman, who, was, who worked on IDS. Um, and he saw, he saw the need for having a standard way for COBOL programmers to interact with the database system. And so they proposed this, uh, this data model and this, this query API 
uh, called CODASIL. That incorporated the network data model from, from and the two by the time query uh, model from the previous slide from, from IDS. And they, they said, this is, the, is going to be the, the standard going forward. Um, so then Bachman left IDS and he worked at this thing called QLane, which has been, been bought and sold over many, many years. And he helped build a new version of a network data model based on CODASIL called IDMS. And this thing is actually still around today. You're obviously, if you're a brand new startup, you wouldn't use this, right? This is for like legacy applications. So the network data model is going to look like this. Right, so say I have this example where I'm, say I'm, I'm, I'm NASA. This is actually a real example. I'm NASA and I'm, keep, I'm doing the, I'm building the rocket for the, for the go to the moon, right? The Apollo moon mission. And so it's a, it's a huge engineering project. I need to keep track of all the parts that are going to my rocket uh, and what manufacturer or what company can provide them for me, right? So they would have this database where you have suppliers and the parts, and then you keep track of what supplier can provide certain parts and what price and what size and so forth. So under the, the network data model, you would have the high level entities, like you would have a supplier, right? Like the name of the company that can provide the part or provide parts. You have the part that you need, and then you have this other set that says, here's the, for, for this supplier, they will supply this, this part at this price. So you would have these high-level entities, um, but then you would have to implicitly have these sets here, what I'm showing in italics, right? You would have the supplies and the supplied by. So you would say, I have a supplier, uh, and there'll be a supply that's in the set of supplies. So now if I want to find, find me all the, 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 find me all the parts that a supplier supplies, I would have to do a bunch of nested for loops, go look over every supplier here, look over, over all their supply sets, get, get the supply types, and then reverse, go back up there. Right, so you basically write, write a bunch of these nested for loops, and you're doing this over one tuple at a time. Another problem is going to be is that the, uh, well, actually, the way you would sort of look like this, if you actually have an instance of this, right, you'd have a supplier, supply, and some parts, and then you would have these, uh, these auxiliary tables, and basically cross-reference tables you would have where you, you keep pointers to the, actual, um, to the actual objects. And so these red lines I'm drawing here, these are actually pointers, like physical pointers to like, here's the location of this record on disk or in memory, right? So again, so now when you get, you're looping through, uh, you know, try to find all the suppliers to apply a certain part, you'd have to look at the first one, and then you do a lookup to find the record in, in this entity, I don't want to call it a table because it's not, uh, and then you would follow the pointer to jump here, and then potentially you'd have a pointer to go back in, in the other direction, right? So the queries, queries are very complex, right? This is all written in COBOL, uh, and it was, it was less efficient because, again, you're, you're operating over a single tuple at a time, and it was easily corruptible. So if this thing gets, if this, you know, Harvard was crappy back then, this supplies or supplied by these collections of data, these pointers, if this thing gets corrupted, your whole database is hosed because now you have no way to, to traverse and, move and find things, uh, you know, to understand the relationships between, between these uh, objects. All right, so the next big system uh, that was in the 1960s was this thing called IMS. And this is actually was built for the Apollo moon mission. So IBM was responsible for the building out a database to keep track of all the parts they were, they were, and NASA was buying to build the rockets. Um, and again, just like for GE and IDS, they built a sort of custom database system for the project and then realized it was useful for other customers and they spun it out as a separate product. And this thing still exists today. And IBM makes a ton of money uh, on this thing, and this database system until today. Um, like if you ever use like an like ATM machine or anything in the bank, a lot of them are still using IMS they set it up in the 70s, and if it's not broken, don't, you know, don't fix it. Um, so IMS is going to use what's called a hierarchical data model. Uh, and just like the, the network data model, it's going to use a two-plot of time queries. But then another big thing is that it's going to support a programmer-defined physical data structures, meaning like if I have a collection of data, like a table, again, I don't want to use the word table because they wouldn't call it that, but assume it's a table. I would actually tell the database system I want to store it as a hash table or I want to store it as a B plus tree. And then based on what I told it I wanted to store it as, you then got a different API to allow you to traverse through the data. Because right? you can't do range queries on hash tables, but you can do it on B plus trees. So going back to our example here, uh, we have a supplier now. Um, 
And I'm an idiot because this I'm not even, I didn't even plug the clicker in. That's that's pathetic. All right, so I'd have a supplier, and now they have parts. All right, that looks a little bit better, right? Because now I don't have to have all this extra stuff. Um, but now, but I do have an implicit uh, relationship between, or uh, sorry, explicit relationship between the supplier and the part, right? A part can only be supplied by by one particular supplier. All right, so now if I go to my instance, right? Say this first guy, if this first vendor, uh, they supply batteries. So I'd have to have another whole record for that. And then I would have to have another record for the second vendor who's supplying maybe the same batteries, but a different price. So let's say now if I change the name of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the part from batteries to I don't know, a brand name battery, whatever, I want to change this, this, this field here. I got to go through and change every single uh, record or instance of where, you know, where, where the batteries exist. Right, so because you're basically repeating information because you couldn't have one part be supplied by multiple suppliers in this model. The other problem you're going to have also too is, as I said, about the since the system exposes the the ability to tell how you actually want to store data, a hash table versus a B plus tree or whatever, then if I change my mind, if I said, okay, I, do, I sorted the hash table, but but I want to do range queries, so let me switch it to a B plus tree. You had no way of easily changing that. You had to actually dump the data, the data out, then load it back in on, under the new uh, data structure. Then you actually had to go update your your code, your your application code, because now it exposed the hash, you know, the B plus tree API instead of the hash table API, right? So there was no independence between the physical layer and the logical layer of what what the data actually was. All right. So this is sort of the yes. Uh, the system just did, didn't support it. Yeah. Uh, with IMS now in like 2023, I mean, I think they put a, a, I think they have a SQL veneer on top of it, right? And I, I think it still has a higher command underneath. There was attempts to convert it to um, relational model in, in the 80s. That didn't pan out. But I mean, this, this is like 1960s. This is the way it just was, right? So this is the motivation for, for the relational model. Um, so in the late 1960s, there was this guy, Ted Codd, who just finished his PhD in math, and he was working at IBM Research, and he saw all of these IMS programmers spending a lot of time rewriting their application code over and over again because of this tight coupling between the, again, the physical layer and, and the logical layer. Um, and so then he realized that, which is actually quite prescient, that this is not scalable. Humans at some point are going to be way more expensive than computers. You know, at the time, computers were super expensive. Humans are cheap. It's the opposite now, right? I can get an Amazon instance for like well, a fraction of a penny an hour, right? but a program is going to cost me 200K. What? Well, now I'm curious. Is that, is, are, you, are you laughing at the 200K? <laughs> yeah. For a database program, that's a bit low. Yeah. 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 I, OK, all right. OK, anyway, database programs aren't cheap. Uh, so, but at the time, again, it was, it was slip. So he saw all these people wasting their time over again, rewriting the application. Uh, and they saw the inefficiency of having this sort of tuple at a time programming API. So the relational model has sort of, was comp has sort of three key parts to it uh, that, again, it serves as the backbone for all the relational, modern relational database systems today. So the first of that, we're going to store the database in simple data structures. So instead of this, this, this graph in the codicil network model or this hierarchy on, under IMS, we're going to store tables of relations, so these single heap things. And if they have relations to uh, or if there are references to other, other tables, we just store that as, again, as another attribute in the relation, right? No need to have explicit pointers to anything. The programmers will be able to access the, the, the database through a high level language. So instead of writing these nested for loops, they'll be able to say, I'll, I'll, it wasn't, he didn't invent SQL at the time, but I, uh, sorry, there was not a programming language like SQL at the time, but he's, he had this idea of like, okay, there's a way to abstract what the actual physical 
uh, materialization of the physical structure of the database system and to say, this is the answer I want, and then the database system could figure it out for you. Right? And then, of course, this also now means that because I have this abstraction between the physical layer and the logical layer, the, the strategy to store the data physically on disk or in memory could be left entirely up to the implementation. Because right? based on what the queries wanted to do, it could decide, decide here's the best way to store your, your data. Right, so the first paper on the relational model came out in 1969. Uh, this is the very, very first one. Um, but this is usually the one everyone cites as, as, the, as, the, as the de facto relational model paper. So this came out in the, the CACM in 1970. But th this was the very first one. So if we go back to our example before of suppliers and, and supplies and parts, right? It looks like this. It's essentially what the, the network model was, but now I don't have this, these explicit membership sets. And then now if I want to start in, in a table or, or in tables in a relational database, right now I have these, these foreign key references uh, that are just attributes in the object, and the database system can understand that you know, this, this supplier number corresponds to some supplier number in this, uh, in this other table here. So it's, we'll, get, we'll get to SQL in a second, but this was a radical idea. Actually, SQL was a radical idea. Um, now we take it for granted because it's, it's so, it's so, uh, it's so uh, prevalent, but back then the, 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 the criticism of the relational model was there's no way a database, of no way a, a, you know, a piece of software is going to write queries as efficient as what a human can write. And this seems sort of strange, but it's sort of the same argument that people made back in the day that there's no way a compiler could generate program code that is more efficient than what a human can write. Sure, that's potentially true for like highly skilled like embedded systems programmers, but nobody writes assembly today, right? Everybody writes in uh, higher level languages, and even higher like up in Python, right? Uh, so, but back then again, this is like the C compiler came out in 1970. This was, this was an insane idea. Uh, and of course, it turned out it was, it was correct. Now, the, it depends on the implementation of the query optimizer, how, how good it is. And we'll see some papers that show how, how things can go wrong. Um, and that's certainly a hard problem. But in general, like, a database system is going to generate a more efficient query plan than an average programmer could actually write. And also now it exposes the database system to people that are maybe aren't programmers, like business analysts or, or, or people doing accounting and reporting. Right? But they're not hardcore programmers. They can write SQL, but maybe not can't write any, any C or C++. So Ted Codd put out the paper in 1970. Again, he was a mathematician. Uh, this, this paper here, it's actually not that hard to read, uh, but when you read the criticisms of it or people talk about it at the time, uh, contemporary conversations about it, people say, oh, it was, it was inscrutable. It was, it was, total, it was you know, heavy on math. It's not, but again, may, maybe 1970s, I don't know, maybe it was. But he didn't, pr he didn't propose a programming language in that paper. He later did, in like 1974, 75, this thing called Alpha that didn't go anywhere. But it was all math at the time. And he, he didn't actually build a system to prove that his idea was working, could work. So what happened was, there was a bunch of people saw his paper, said, hey, I think this is a good idea, and actually started building experimental systems to test that out. So the very first system that I'm aware of that did this uh, was this thing called the Peter Lee Rel Relational Test Vehicle which sounds like a 1970s like, druggy ban. Um, but these are like people in the UK that basically read his paper and like, oh, I think it's a good idea. And they built sort of early prototypes. It's before SQL. It, you know, they talk about how you could store massive data sets of like 1,000 tuples. Like that was mind blowing for them back then. Um, that, one, that one usually people forget about. That's, as far as I know, that's the very first one. But there's two other projects uh, that came one or two years after, uh, System R at IBM and then Ingress at Berkeley. Right, these are considered the very first two uh, relational database systems that like, try, to, or try to build something based on Ted Codd's work and actually build a real system. I think Mimer SQL came out out of Sweden maybe a, one or two years later. Um, but this is an academic project. This still exists today. And of course, Oracle with Larry Ellison, we know about that. Uh, and we'll cover that throughout the semester. Basically, the, the, I mean, it was all, all, all happening in Silicon Valley. Larry Ellison basically copied what IBM did. Uh, he would literally call them on the phone and ask about like, hey, you know, how does this work? And they would tell him because they were researchers and didn't know. And he went and, and copied it. Um, and then uh, 
Ingress eventually got commercialized at, at the university uh, in the late 70s because people actually started really using it because they, they understood the, the significance of the relational model. But again, 1970s, it was not clear. It was, could, be, could have been codicil, could have been relational model. And eventually, in the, in the 1980s, relational model won. So two things happened, three things happened. First is that IBM never commercialized System R. Uh, they could have. They could have made. You know, they could have been a dominant player in, in the in the database marketplace, but they they dropped the ball on this because they were making so much money on IMS. Like, why would you kill the golden goose with this other new database system that that may not work when you're making so much money on IMS? But eventually, they saw the light and they put out their first relational database system called SQL DS in 1981. This had remnants of System R, uh, but a lot of it was I think written from scratch. Uh, SQL DS is still around. They renamed it to DB2. It's like DB2 for VSE. Or there's some, there's some like, you know, mainframe system that they wrote, they wrote SQL DS for. There's five versions of DB2. It's hard to keep track of them. Um, but then the, what we know about, you know, how we, what we consider DB2 today, that first came out in 1983. So when this came out in 83, this was sort of the shot across the bow in the database industry to say, okay, now IBM is serious about the relational model. These are real, you know, is a real idea. Uh, Ingress and Oracle were already, already still in the marketplace, but it basically showed that okay, the relational model is, is the way forward, and SQL became the de facto standard when this came out in, in 83. And Oracle was at the right place at the right time because when, when IBM, you know, IBM was not what it is today, they were the juggernaut in the computing industry, so they said, hey, this is the way it's going to be, this is the language we're going to use, everyone said, okay, yeah, that's, IBM says it, that's, that's what we're going to do. When Oracle was there, we said, hey, we already support SQL, we're good to go. Ingress had its own programming language called Quell that Stonebreaker still claims is, is better than, than SQL. Uh, they eventually supported SQL, but you know, it was by the time they, they added it, it was too late. So SQL, so originally was spelled as S-E-Q-E-L, because uh, it's supposed to be the SQL to Quell, right? Uh, like a play on words. And then they got sued for um, trademark infringement, so then they renamed it to SQL. Um, and then there was a standards body to figure out, okay, what should be the programming language we use in the, uh, for, for relational databases. Um, and supposedly they were going to use Quell instead of SQL, but Stonebreaker didn't like standards bodies and decided not to submit any paperwork for Quell. Uh, so there's this uh, paragraph here from the, the Larry Ellison unauthorized biography, I don't want to even call it, uh, but it came out in the late 90s, where they basically talk about how they thought Quell was better than SQL, but, but Mike hated standards body, so he didn't submit anything. Uh, anyway, so that's why we ended up with SQL instead of, instead of Quell. There's this one, uh, on Hacker News, occasionally you see like, people say, hey, I invented a new version of SQL, or a better version of SQL. And they, a lot of the things they end up fixing, the problems with, with, uh, in SQL, like having the from clause after the select clause, like Quell already did that in the 70s. Um, but we ended up with SQL. Oops, sorry. Right, so Oracle, Oracle basically wins the crown during the 1980s. There's a bunch of other startups uh, that come along that do relational databases. Sybase, Informix, Interbase, uh, Teradata was a data warehouse. Tandem got bought by DEC. Basically, the only one that's still thriving today, I would say, is Oracle and, and DB2. And thriving's not the right word. I mean, all these, like, Sybase still makes a ton of money. But again, if you're, if you're a new startup, a new company, you wouldn't use it. A lot of these systems are still in maintenance mode, right? Uh, but Oracle is, is being actively loved, and then same, same with DB2. Teradata is, uh, they're, getting, they're getting crushed by Snowflake. Um, so Stonebreaker, he, he commercializes Ingress, goes back to Berkeley, starts a new day system called Postgres. If you ever wanted Postgres, it's called Postgres because it's post-Ingress. It's the system he built after Ingress. Um, and instead of being a relational database system, he called, he called this thing as an object relational database system. Because object-oriented programming was the hot thing in the 1980s. Uh, and this is why they've, you know, Postgres was designed from the very beginning to be very extensible. You can have user-defined types, user-defined functions, and so forth, because they wanted to, to, to borrow some of the ideas of object-oriented databases, which will be in the next slide, and be able to extend Postgres very easily. So even today, technically Postgres is an object relational database system, but people, people mostly ignore this part, the object part. All right, so where are we at so far? 1970s, 
uh, code is still, is, is, you know, it's there, COBOL, the, the COBOL way to program databases is there. Relational model comes out. People say, hey, this is a bad idea. You know, code is still is the right way to do it. Eventually, the relational model wins. Right? And there's all these relational databases that come out in the, the 1980s, early 1980s. 10 years later after that, then we end up with these object oriented databases. Again, what I'm saying, where people come along every 10 years and say, I have a better idea. So in the 1980s, uh, people recognized that if, if application developers are going to use an object oriented programming language, like C++ is the hot thing in the, in the late 1980s, um, that there was this impedance mismatch where the way the database system represented data as relations did not map cleanly into how objects or object oriented programming represented data. So you'd have to write these SQL queries that would basically convert rows into now objects with sort of nested hierarchies. And so a bunch of companies said, well, this is kind of stupid. What if we just stored the objects directly in the database as objects? Um, so there's a couple of systems, Versant, Object Store, O2. I think MarkLogic actually just got bought uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but they were, like, they, were, they were late 90s. Um, and so a bunch of these systems don't exist anymore. Or they, again, they're in maintenance mode. The, what, what killed them was that there was no standard query language you could use for object-oriented databases. Eventually, they, they proposed OQL, the object query language, but nobody, nobody supported that, and it was too late. And so basically the problem was because you had this tight coupling between the database system and the programming language, it made your application less portable. It wasn't very easy for you to switch to another object-oriented database system because you were writing to their proprietary API, similar to how IMS exposed a proprietary API to their, to their internal data structures. So now SQL is supposed to be a standard course, uh, but for basic queries, yes, you can easily switch them from one database to another. The, you know, every, every vendor has their own proprietary extensions. So even though there is a standard, it isn't, uh, it isn't uh, you know, there isn't a universal standard that everyone follows. Um, so, you know, you can make the same argument about SQL today. ORMs hide, hide a lot of this. All right, so here's what it looks like. So say we have a, an application code. We want to store student information. So a student has an ID, a name, an email address, and then a potential list of phone numbers. So the way you would represent this, pre potentially represent this in, in a pure relational model, meaning where there's, there's only scalar values, you'd have to have a student, re student table and then a student phone table. Um, so that now if I want, in my programming language, if I want to instantiate this object, I would have to do a lookup where I either first query the, the you know, the student, and then do a second query to go get all the phone numbers, or do a join, and, and then make sure I throw away the, the redundant uh, student inf you know, information when, when I get the result back. So again, the object-oriented databases guys say, would say, this is stupid. Object-oriented databases people say, this is stupid. Just store the, the entire, you know, the, the nested objects together in, in a single record, and now it's only one fetch to the database and one, one read call to go, go bring this data in. So the problem with this, though, is uh, you know, for a simple example, where if there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence between a student phone number and, and, and the student, sure, this is probably fine. In fact, the, in, a, in modern relational database systems, you could store the phone number as an array of, of strings. Like most systems will let you support that. The trouble is now, when you go back to that, that part supplier issue, if you now start embedding uh, or denormalizing the, 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 all the parts that a supplier supplies and put them into the supplier record, then I have that problem where if I need to update a field, I have duplicate information, and my application code needs to make sure all that's in sync. I don't, you know, I don't, uh, I don't update some of the records, but not all of them. And so doing complex joins, uh, make, making sure you have uh, data integrity, becomes problematic in, in, in this approach. And I'm saying there's some cases where you do want to store JSON. And again, there are Postgres, other data systems that will have a JSON type. And, and the the method to store JSON data in a binary form efficiently instead of just text. Uh, you know, MongoDB does this. They have their own BSON uh, data type. Postgres has something similar. Right, so again, a lot of the ideas that were done in, in these specialized systems or these, these non-relational systems have now you know, found their way into relational systems. All right, so then the, um, the 1990s, I'll call it the boring days. 
Uh, there wasn't any sort of radical change or to the Harvard landscape or the, the workload landscape, right? There wasn't, you know, it wasn't like the advent of the cloud or, or, or you know, microcomputers of the 1980s. Just like, all right, things are going along, things are getting better, Harvard's getting better, data sets are getting bigger, but it really wasn't, uh, it wasn't dramatic change, right? So I think the sort of four major events would be Microsoft bought a, a, a copy or license to the Sybase source code, forks it, and then they create SQL Server. Um, SQL Server supports T-SQL, uh, which is their variant of SQL. And that comes from Sybase. Sybase invented T-SQL. Um, at this point, again, SQL Server is state-of-the-art. Sybase is in maintenance mode. Uh, and I don't know how much of the original Sybase code is still in SQL Server these, these days. They did major rewrites in 2000, or they did major rewrites in 1998 and in 2006. MySQL started, get, uh, there's a guy in, in, I think he's in Finland, started rewriting, or started writing his own uh, database system to replace MSQL and called it MySQL. It's My is the name of his daughter. Um, there's, he also did MariaDB, that's his other daughter. Uh, then he has, a, he, has a, he has a son named Max, and there's MaxDB, like he names all his data set after his kids. Postgres, again, originally started as an academic project, Strumberger loved Quell. In the 1980s, when they first started writing it, it was, it was used Quell. But then in like 95, 96, two grad students took the original academic source code and then converted it to, to make it actually support SQL. And that's, that's why it's called PostgresQL. Um, did anybody know what the original programming language uh, Postgres was written in, in the 1980s? Let's take a guess. Is this Cobalt now? Abby, can you close the door? Can you, can you, can you, can you take a guess? Lisp. Yeah. <laughs> it was the 80s, right? I don't know, cocaine or whatever. Like, uh, and then they realized that was a bad idea, so then they had a compiler convert the Lisp into C and compile that, and then that was a bad idea, so they rewrote everything in C. Um, and then SQLite started early 2000. Uh, it's, it's one dude invented this down in uh, North Carolina. Richard Hip, um, and he's still like the main programmer on this today. The one thing that did change, I would say it was not a dramatic change, is that people started to realize, okay, I don't just want to use my data system to, to, for transactions and ingest new data. I also want to, do, want to start doing analytics on it, start extrapolating new information. Uh, business intelligence, decision support, comes up, has a bunch of different names. And all these systems at the time were all row stores. And as we know, running analytical queries on a row store is, is highly inefficient. So there was this optimization technique called data cubes, where you basically think of it like a materialized view, where you pre-computed these multi-dimensional arrays uh, of different like, group eyes and aggregations and so forth, and you would pre-compute that, and then you run your analytics on those. Nobody really uses data cubes today because column storage is so, so, much, is so much faster, but this is how people got by in the 1990s. All right, so the big game changer, though, was in the 2000s, when the internet comes along. So again, prior to this, when you think about it, who had big databases? The big banks, Walmarts, right? The, only like the Fortune 500 companies had big database problems. But when the internet comes along, uh, it doesn't take that much for you know, a small number of people to put something on the internet and have a lot of people start using you know, the application, the website, and you start generating a lot of traffic and a lot of data, and a lot of users, right? So, that, that, so th this was a big change in how people approach databases in the 2000s. So, but at the time, all of the sort of the commercial enterprise databases were very heavyweight. So Oracle, DB2, Sybase, and they were very expensive. Um, and then the open source databases that we think about today, like Postgres and My MySQL, they were pretty primitive back in the day. And MySQL didn't support transactions well until InnoDB came along. 2003-2004. So what people ended up doing was writing out their own sort of custom middleware uh, to route queries to these single node database instances. So they would sort of treat MySQL as like a dumb key value store and then have something in front of it to route queries to different shards. That, I, the idea is still widely used today, but the people were rolling their own back, the, back, back then. The other thing that happened was Again, as I was saying, it doesn't take that much to start collecting a lot of data. But more people started wanting, wanting to analyze this data. And then they, we realized, or they realized, that the, the sort of general purpose 
database systems as a row store that tries to do you know, transactions and analytics was a bad idea. People started building these custom analytical database systems, which again will be the, the, the sort of key idea that we're focusing on this semester. So a lot of these were distributed and shared nothing. Almost all of these were going to be, actually all of these were, were uh, relational and SQL. Uh, most of them were forks of, of Postgres. Um, and they're going to store the database in, in, as, a, as column stores. Again, it seems like, seems like an obvious idea now. And because you know, the, the, the wins you get from it are so significant, back then this was unheard of. Well, not unheard of, because the idea is from the 70s, but like having data that explicitly stored data as columns, that was novel. That, that, was, that was a game changer. So the, sort of the main systems at this time were, were listed here. So Natiza was a fork of Postgres, but they put a FPGA down in the storage layer to make it, make it run filters faster. Uh, Park sells a fork of Postgres, it's distributed version of Postgres. This is actually what Redshift is. Redshift, they bought a license to Park Cell, didn't really make any changes, just slapped it up, called it Redshift. The, what's that? No, I think yeah, this is, this, is, this is not a secret, I'm just telling you, right? This is public. Uh, and so they're like, they just threw it up. It made so much money. Oh, shit, now we got to start making this real, right? And it, it's been written uh, many times over. Uh, Vertica, that's a company that was started by uh, my advisors, Mike uh, Stonebreaker and then Sandesonic. That's a fork of Postgres. Data Allegro was uh, a sharded version of Ingress. And then Greenplum is a fork of Postgres. MoneyDB was, uh, was actually the only one here that was written from scratch. Uh, and that came out of CWI. The same, have you ever heard of DuckDB? It's the same research group that, that made, made MoneyDB. DuckDB was originally called MoneyDB Lite. It was a fork of MoneyDB to run embedded in like our programs. And then they rewrote it and ended up being uh, DuckDB. I don't know, I may have to bleep this, I'm not sure this is public. Microsoft bought Data, okay, so Microsoft bought, bought Data Allegro, IBM bought Natiza, Parkcell, they can never get bought, they just end up getting licensed. I think the company's dead. Vertica got acquired by HP, MoneyDB got never bought, and then Greenplum got bought by... Yeah. No. Uh, EMC. Really? Yeah, hold on. So, wait, at some point they were owned by EMC. It's hard to keep track of this. They got bought, and then, and then, and then they, they divested it off to an EMC. No, I take it back. EMC had a database piece. <laughs> VMware had a database piece. They took it out, and they formed a new company called Pivotal. Uh, that was it was Greenplum and then SQL Fire or Gemfire, uh, which I think he, that no yeah EMC bought them VMware bought SQL Fire they 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 took them out made Pivotal and then VMware bought Pivotal so it's it, yeah uh, so Data Allegro got bought by Microsoft it was a hacked up version of of sharded Ingress and I think they paid a sh money for it and then. After they bought it, so after they wrote the check, then they had their technical people actually look at it and said, this is all crap, we can't use any of this, and they threw it all away. <laughs> and they, they made them, they end up running uh, the SQL Server data warehouse from scratch, the parallel data warehouse, instead of using any of this garbage. So uh, there's another one too, uh, missing Astro data. They were bought by, they were bought, by, I think, by Teradata. Right, okay. All right, so the, the, while this, all this work was, going, was happening on these, on these parallel column store data warehouses, there was this other big trend of these MapReduce systems. Again, so what, it's been 10 years now since object-oriented databases were a bad idea. So now we're 10 years later. So, so these, this thing comes along from Google, uh, and they built a custom execution engine with this MapReduce programming model that to help them crawl their, uh, to build the index for, for the web crawl. And they end up using it for a bunch of other data processing uh, tasks or analytical tasks. So Google put out the paper, uh, say, hey, this is what we're using. This probably still happens now, but you know, Google was really you know, the, the super hot thing in the 2000s. Right? Anything, anything they did, any paper they put out, people did end up going and re-implement themselves because they thought, oh, if Google's making a ton of money because they have all these custom systems, let's go build our own custom system too. Right? Uh, like HBase is a clone of Bigtable. Because Cassandra is a clone of Bigtable and, and DynamoDB. GFS. Yeah, there was actually HDFS. Hadoop was the clone of, 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 of MapReduce, right? So Google puts out, Map, put, puts out the MapReduce paper. Yahoo says, sees that. So that's a good idea. We can use it too. So they wrote their own open source version called Hadoop. Um, 
And the basic idea was that you'd write these user-defined functions like a map and reduce and a shuffle phase, which we'll cover later on, or actually next class. Um, so instead of using SQL, you'd write these like custom functions, and you just submit them to the, database, to, to the map reduce or Hadoop framework, and it'll run them for you. But it, it takes us back to the 1970s, where the, the programmer had to define what the data model actually was for the data they were processing. Right? There was no SQL at the time on these systems. You had to literally write, like, I'll parse the, the I'm going to parse this CSV file, and I expect them to have these columns. And you, and you would write that explicit expectations in, your, in, the, in the programming code or in, the, in the, these functions. So this was the hot thing in the late 2000s. Everyone's like, this is, this is the way to do this, yada, yada. Um, and then Stonebreaker and then uh, this other guy who does invented a lot of the first Palo databases put out an article that said this is a bad idea. Then I, I, I wrote a paper with them and showed it was. Uh, and then people eventually realized, oh, yeah, it turns out the old guys are right. This is a bad idea. So then they tried to put SQL on top of MapReduce. Uh, Facebook invented Hive, and there's a thing called MapRDB at a MapR, which I think, I think they're dead now. Um, but then it turned out that was super inefficient and super slow because the way just sort of the, the way Hadoop was actually implemented, or I don't know exactly how, how the MapR's framework actually worked, but the way they were sort of storing these checkpoints at every single stage of the query was super inefficient. Uh, and so all this got, got thrown away. I mean, Hive still exists, but like, people realized this is actually, not a, bad, this is actually a bad idea. Uh, and that you want, a, you, know, you want a parallel database warehouse. You want the thing that, that we were showing before. But it, again, it took 10 years for people to realize this, this was a bad idea. Also related to, I'm going to say bad ideas here too, but um, there was this NoSQL movement, again, I think brought upon by, by Google in the big table paper. They basically said, hey, the, the relational model is bad. The, the SQL is too slow for, for modern web applications. We don't need transactions. We don't need joins. We want to build these systems from scratch. Because right? you have to understand, like, if you're building a website, you want this thing up 24-7 in, a, in a, a database system that supports transactions that maybe didn't have you know, backups of, or replicas for high availability. That means if, if you know, no goes down, if your whole website goes down, that's bad. You lose money. So the NoSQL guys basically said, well, OK, maybe it's, it's, so we're going to let system maybe have corrupt data or not strictly follow you know, transactional semantics or transactional support in exchange for always being up, always being online. So there's a bunch of these systems that got built uh, under this model. Some things, sometimes it's OK. Right? So DynamoDB was built by Amazon for the shopping cart. You know, if, if I put something in my shopping cart and it maybe disappears, is it the end of the world? Probably not. Uh, if I put something in my bank account and it disappears, yeah, that's a big problem. Right? So all these systems basically follow different looser semantics over what the traditional you know, relational, transactional, high, you know, strongly consistent database systems would follow to varying degrees of success. Uh, and as I said before, basically everybody supports SQL now, except for Redis and I think RavenDB. Like they all have their own version of SQL, but it's basically SQL, without wanting to say it. React is dead, so they're, I, don't, I don't think they have anything. And then Oracle knows SQL, I don't think it's just perfectly DB uh, underneath the covers. At the same time, or sort of soon after the, 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 new SQL, the NoSQL databases got popular, there was another movement called New SQL, and this one I was involved in where the idea was that you wouldn't have the same high scalability and performance of a NoSQL database system, but without giving up transactions. Now obviously, you, know, you, can't, you, know, it, you, know, you can't you can't go faster than the speed of light. So if you have you know, machines in different areas of the, of the world, you can't make that go faster. But you can at least make sure that things are correct. So all the systems that came out under the sort of NoSQL movement, with maybe the exception of of VoltDB, MemSQL got renamed to, to a single store. And they wouldn't necessarily call themselves a, a new SQL system now. And then, well, Spanner didn't fail. Spanner's still here. Spanner's legit. But for the most part, a bunch of these you've never heard of before. Like TransLattice, I'm sure nobody's heard of. GeneDB, they all pretty much failed. Uh, Foundation, Foundation DB had a SQL layer that was kind of crap. Apple bought them, threw that away, uh, and they since open source it. But it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not used as a relational data system with SQL now. But what did happen, though, all, a bunch of these systems didn't pan out. The new transactional database systems uh, are actually getting some traction. And these sort of fall under the umbrella of 
distributed SQL. Instead of calling it new SQL, which is sort of vague, you say, oh, it's a distributed SQL system. So TidyB is out of uh, China. CockroachDB is, is probably the, raised the most money of all these. And then Yugabyte uh, is another startup that's based on Postgres. And then ComDB2 was built by, I think, Bloomberg. I've never heard anybody use ComDB2 outside of Bloomberg. Um, but it, it is open source. It does exist. All right, so the main takeaway here is that these systems you know, these systems are going against the conventional wisdom that like, you want a relational model, you want a SQL one in transactions, because all the NoSQL systems are hot. By the time that people realize, oh yeah, shit, I do want SQL, I do want transactions, they, you know, they failed or it didn't, didn't, didn't pan out, and then these systems were the right place at the right time, building off the things that the earlier systems had done. All right, finishing up. So we have cloud systems. Again, we'll cover this a lot throughout the semester. Basically now the, the, the hardware landscape has changed, People are no longer running on-prem. You're now running in, in a cloud, right? And that means your, your, your resources can be elastic. You don't have to go through this long provisioning cycle of like, hey, I want to buy these machines and procurement, and it takes a long time to actually get them. You know, with a credit card, you can spin up a new instance very, very quickly. So initially, there was a bunch of these, these databases as a service uh, products or, or offerings where it would just take like off-the-shelf MySQL, run it in a VM for you. This is before containers. Run it in a VM for you. And they charge you for that. But it didn't, MySQL wasn't really aware that it's running in the cloud. It's just running on you know, some, some, some VM. But since then, there's now systems designed from scratch explicitly for running in a, in a, in a cloud system. And we would call these cloud native. Snowflake's probably the most, the most famous one of all these. Like they designed explicitly in the beginning not to run on-prem. They're only going to run in the cloud. And they, therefore, you can make certain design choices, which we'll cover next week, that can take advantage of that. One of the big things also, too, that came out of the, the, the MapReduce world, plus now with the cloud, are these shared disk systems. So prior to this, the, the, the conventional wisdom of how you would build a distributed database system is, would be shared nothing. But now with the cloud, where Amazon or whoever is taking care of the storage layer for you, uh, you don't want to maybe build a shared nothing system. You want to use a shared disk system and let, let the cloud vendor handle the storage for you. So there's a bunch of systems now built on top of this, of this shared disk approach. This is the factors, this is how everyone's building modern sort of data systems today. And when people talk about, oh, I have a data lake, right? Or, or, or you know, we'll see this I think, when we talk about Databricks. Uh, they're talking about basically storing on, on S3, right? So, so, with a shared disk model. All right, every year I get I a complain about this. Um, so, we're at the sort of phase now where it's, it's again, NoSQL, the NoSQL movement died out. People realize SQL is, is, the, is, is the way to go. Um, still humming along, I wouldn't necessarily, maybe not necessarily call these a NoSQL systems, um, but they've definitely come more prominent in the last five or six years, are these graph database systems. But the idea is that instead of storing your, 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 your database as, as relations, well, it's, native, it's, it's, it's intrinsically, it's a graph. Let me store it as a graph structure, right, between relations and so forth. And this can be either RDF or triple store or proper property graphs. It has a bunch of different names. But it's essentially the same thing that they were doing back in the 70s with, with the, the code of sale network model. So the big claim is that because you're storing a database as natively as graphs, and because you're now exposing a native graph API, you can be much better than a relational database system, right? We've heard that before. That, that was the argument for the object-oriented databases. Uh, it's the object, you know, the, 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 the JSON databases. All these people make the same argument. And so, sure, there are some times where you do want to traverse the, you know, maybe your, your database uh, as, as, you know, in a sort of native graph uh, way. But the SQL standard is actually adding support for graph queries this year, right? And it's based on Cypher, which was invented by, uh, by Neo4j. So, so they lose that advantage. So then, OK, what about the, the argument that, OK, well, if I'm starting things natively as a graph, isn't that going to be better than a relational database? Well, no, because the paper that came out last week shows that if you build DuckDB, you incorporate some, uh, some techniques that will help explicitly for graph workloads, like multi-way joins, which we will cover later in the semester, you can outperform Neo4j by 10x. Right, Neo4j has raised hundreds of millions of dollars DuckDB is like, you know, a, a small team of people in, in, in the Netherlands. And, and they beat them by 10x. 
and it's and it's a real system. It's not like a, you know just a toy. So I think graph databases. Again, we've already seen this. The, the, uh, see this the relational models absorbing ideas from it, and I don't see these systems really replacing the uh, the relational databases. You know, in my lifetime, I should have put, put a screenshot. I, I made a public bet where, in uh, I made I made a public bet that said in 2020 by 2030, if the graph database market exceeds the relational database market, I will change my official CMU directory photo to be like. So I'm sure with me says I love graph databases and I will use that <laughs> in, until I die or get fired from CMU. I, I don't see it happening. All right, uh, so quickly finish up. Time series databases. So these are now newer databases that are designed to store telemetry you're collecting or metrics you're collecting from uh, other services, other devices, and so forth. And it's relational. It's just there's this notion of, of explicit time and ordering in the data you're, you're, you're generating. And therefore, you can design the system to officially take advantage of, uh, of, the, of the domain you're working in. So you wouldn't want to use these for storing arbitrary, arbitrary data. Right? If you have this notion of like ticks or events are showing up in, in, in some, with some notion of time, and you want to do range queries on, on based on those times, uh, you can just design a system to be more efficient to do this. So probably the three main ones would be timescale, which is using extensions on top of Postgres, which is super cool. Because you can get regular tables in Postgres plus the, the time series ones. InfluxDB uh, is written from scratch. Uh, it's like, I think they're their third rewrite. Um, but they, they're, you know, again, they're targeting time series databases. And then ClickHouse is out of, um, ClickHouse is out of uh, Russia. Uh, this is probably, when, you, when I first learned about ClickHouse, when you read the website and all the things they supported, which a lot of techniques we, we discussed in the class, it seemed unreal. Like, look, this is super state of the art. Um, the, the performance numbers look amazing. The, my impression, though, is that it is, uh, it's not easy to get up and running. Like, there's, still, it's still a lot of, there's still a lot of manual work you have to do. But I, I think this one's going to be a, a big player. And then Prometheus is, is another uh, big effort in this space. All right, last one. Blockchain databases. <laughs> so. Uh, Yes, Bitcoin, you know, if you bought Bitcoin in 2010, great, thanks, congrats. Um, but like people have made claims that like, okay, blockchain databases are, you know, under Web3 or whatever you want to call it, like this is a radical different way of how you want to build modern applications. Like the old way of having these provisioning servers of our relational databases and SQL and whatever, all that's stupid. You want to build on top of a blockchain database. It's going to solve all the world's problems. At the end of the day, what is a blockchain? It's just a log, they would call a ledger. It's like a write-ahead log, or the Paxos log, the state log. Here's all the, here's all the events or things that are happening to the state of the database. And then they have these, these incremental checksums where the checksum of, of a new, new entry in the log depends on the, the previous entry of the log. So that way, if you fudge anything below that uh, in a previous entry, the checksum doesn't match, and you know you don't have the, the full data. Right? The, the technique was invented on, on Merkle trees. And then now, since you're assuming you're running in a decentralized distributed environment, where you don't trust the people that are, that are reading right into the database, you have to use some Byzantine fault tolerant or BFT protocol to come to consensus to say, what's the next entry we should put in the log, right? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of cool ideas uh, and put together in an interesting way, but is this game changer? No. Right? I've yet to see a use case that anybody has proposed where a blockchain would solve a problem that you could not solve with a traditional SQL database like Postgres. Or some, you have some external, uh, external issue you have to resolve through like law, right? Like le legal matters, right? So, right, so, so I think this is all garbage. Um, these, these systems here are explicitly doing blockchain with, with a, uh, in, on our decentralized model. Um, this is the logo for PLDB. Amazon has the worst logos because it's like, unless you know what this is, what is it, right? Like, so it, QL, QLDB is a quantum ledger database. It's not a blockchain database where it's like decentralized. Like Amazon's the trusted authority. Like you authenticate to Amazon. Uh, you don't have to do BFT. I think they just do two-base commit. Um, but you still get that, that verifiable ledger uh, of, of the, with the checksums. As far as I know, this has not gone anywhere. Uh, you know, they make way more money on selling, you know, re reselling MySQL and Postgres as RDS 
or under Aurora. Again, I, at this point, I'm, I'm, when I first saw these databases, I'm like, yeah, maybe there's something. I'm convinced this is all crap. And I would say also, too, there's no inherent data model to a, a blockchain database. It's just entries in the log, just bytes. There's some engine up, up, up above it that has to interpret what those bytes are. So it could be a key value store, it could be a relational database. It doesn't matter. All right, so there's a bunch of other stuff. This should be 2020, so it's a typo. There's a bunch of other systems, uh, categories, and things we, we can talk about. Embedded databases like SQLite and, and uh, RocksDB and, and, uh, and DuckDB. Those multimodal or multimodal databases where like, like a RangoDB where you try to support graphs and, and relations and documents all in a single one. Uh, in the paper you guys read, we talked about hardware acceleration. Uh, basically, people, it's like the, the search for like, you know, El Dorado, like the, the, you know, the golden city in, in South America. There's been a search for some kind of hardware accelerator for databases for the last 40, 50 years. It never pans out. People keep trying, uh, but it never works. Well, not that it doesn't work, it's just you, it never gets, never gets the adoption in the market because commodity hardware is always going to win. I don't think FPGAs or, or GPUs are a, a big game changer in this space. Risk five could potentially do some interesting stuff, but where you're going to see hardware accelerators for databases is only going to be from the cloud vendors, like Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, because at their scale, they can justify paying $50 million in development to build up new custom hardware because they're going to make so much money and be more efficient for you know, their millions of customers. It's very hard. It'd be, I think it'd be very hard for an independent software vendor, independent hardware vendor, to, to break into that market. Because either, because not only have to design the chip or whatever the hardware accelerator is, they then got to go convince some other software company to put it in their database system. And it never happens. We didn't really talk about array, matrix, and vector database systems. Uh, the vector database is the new buzzword now because of machine learning. So there's a bunch of these, like you do nearest neighbor search on, on vector uh, vectors in your database. These have been around for a while, uh, but the vector ones are new. I would say this is the only, as far as I can know for now, this is the only type of data that you wouldn't actually want to use a relational database system for, where you want to use a specialized system explicitly designed for, for vectors. Because when you think about it, what do you need? If it's a multidimensional uh, array, you got to go traverse it maybe row-wise and column-wise and in different dimensions. And storing that in, in a table with index columns is a bad idea. So I think. We'll see whether the market is big enough uh, to justify needing a specialized system. At this point, the answer is no, as I say in the paper, because is there, does Amazon or Microsoft or Google offer a vector database as a service? No. They could build one. They have, they have unlimited money, but they don't see there being a, a large enough market yet. So I think it's still too early, but I think this, this could be the next, the next thing. All right, and of course, there's a ton of, there's a ton of these logos. Uh, it's hard to keep track. Uh, I clicked. All right, so uh, what's going to happen in, in the future? So we're, I think right now we're in the golden era of databases, meaning like there's so many different choices, open source, commercial, cloud systems, uh, on-prem. Uh, SQL is, is considered the, the, the way to go forward right now. Again, that'll change in 10 years, um, but we'll, we'll be back again. An example would be all the NoSQL systems from 10 years ago, except for Redis, have either died or they, they support SQL, and something that looks like the relational model. So it's like you know, one plus one equals two. That basic arithmetic from you know thousands of years ago, it stands the test of time because it's the right way to do this. That's what I sort of see as a relational model. Now, is SQL the best way, best query language you could have for a relational database system? No, there's, there's obviously lots of problems with it. But at this point, there's so much. Uh, there's so much buy-in, there's so much existing tooling and, 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 and uh, utilities that assume the, the, a, SQL, a SQL database system, it'd be very hard for anybody to, to change that, right? I mean, there's so much fracturing in SQL itself. How are you going to come along and say, I have a new, new query language, uh, and then everyone's going to start using it? Yeah, you can build your one system that does it, but then nobody else is going to use it. So I don't know where SQL is going to go in the future other than borrowing ideas from, from other other you know, uh, non-SQL systems. Um, but I see the relational model being you know, standing the test of time, in my opinion. There's a reason why Ted Codd won the Turing Award for it. Charles Bachman won the Turing Award for Codacell for Erst. Uh, I guess they're both dead, so it doesn't matter. All right. All right, so next class. I got to go deal with some court in Seattle. So next week will be not in person. I'll post the, the Monday lecture and Wednesday lecture on YouTube. 
but we'll kick off starting to talk about modern analytical data systems. And we'll read about, it's, the paper's about Snowflake, it's from the Snowflake people. And yes, there's some details about Snowflake, but I really want you to understand the big idea of like, okay, running on a shared disk architecture in the cloud. And then make sure you submit your first reading review uh, before, before the class on two o'clock. Yes? Monday, Wednesday, right? What did, I, what did I say? There's no, there's no reading review Tuesday, right? No, not, not no yeah, there isn't. Did, did I say Tuesday? No, uh, I'm just confusing. Make sure, you, make sure you submit your first reading review Monday. <laughs> okay? Okay, awesome guys. Thank you. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all pass. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes. It's the SD Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>